Wednesday. I didn't know I was walking around looking so sad till Spicy said something. While plucking chickens for the dinner meal, I told her about Mama. I told her about how my Mama got caught in the never-ending fight that goes on in the big house between Maz Henley and Ms. Lily. Soon after Ola was sold, Moss Henley gave Mom away to his sister and brother-in-law, Amelia and Wallace Morgan, as a wedding-in present. Since Mama was a good dressmaker, she could bring good money into their house. I was a baby and not part of the deal. Aunt T say Ms. Lily was so mad when she found out Mama had been gave way, say she turned purple, no doubt worried about who was going to make her dresses. The matter Ms. Lily got, the more set in his way Mass Henley got, you made me get rid of Ola, now you've got to let Risa go. That brought about a fainting spell, the kind Miss Lily gets when she's trying to win a point. All her falling out couldn't save Mama. She had to go to Richmond. Later. The night before Mama was taken away, she gave me to Auntie and Uncle Heb. When Uncle Heb retells it, he say it was right after the big times, the first of the year. Clody is yours now. Take care of her. Love her if you can, she told him. I only got to see Mama a few times after that. Once when Wallace and Amelia come to Belmont and brought her along to take care of their baby. Then during the Christmas holiday, she got a pass to come visit. Each time she came, we laughed and talked, cried and held each other. She always waited till I fell asleep. Then she'd leave. When I woke up, Mama would be gone. Just gone. Five winters ago, a rider come to Belmont. Wasn't long before Moss Henley come to the kitchen with the news. Risa is dead, he said. His voice sounded flat like unleavened bread. Didn't take long for the words to take hold. Mama was gone on to glory. Just gone. I remember hearing the people in the quarter singing all through the night. Crossing over, crossing over, crossing over into Zion. Crossing over, crossing over the beautiful city of God. When I finished my story, Spicy said, Your story is my story. Then we both cried. After talking to Spicy, I felt lots better. Spicy and I have laughed together, cried together, and shared each other's hurts. We're becoming good friends. I like that. Monday. Moss Henley and Hints have gone to a race over in Chester. Ms. Lily been into it with William all morning. He stormed out of the house and spent the morning with Uncle Heb at the stables. There was no lesson today. Tuesday. During study time, the missus turned to figure in numbers. The numbers don't come to me quick like the letters and words do. But even as bad as I am, William is still worse. Wednesday, June 1st, 1859. There was a meeting at Belmont this evening. While I was serving up sweets and coffee... I overheard Moss Henley say he's supporting a Cleophus Tucker who was running for Congress. Moss Henley is planning to put on a big party in his honor on the 4th of July. Tucker's the man we need in Washington, Moss Henley told the members of the group. They left the newspaper on the table, so when I was cleaning it up, I hid it under my dress to read later. Next day. I read as much of the newspaper as I could, picking out words I know. It's still a heap of words I don't know, but I did find out abolistines are A-B-O-L-I-T-I-O-N-I-S-T-S. I know the right spelling of the words now. I also found out that abolitionists live in a places called New York, the Boston, and the Philadelphia. Then there's something called Underground Railroad that slaves get rides on to get away to freedom. I really want to know more about that. I wrote all these names on a piece of paper. I'll bind my time. When the chance comes, I'll try to find these things on Moss Henley's book of maps. Friday. The rains have finally stopped. No rain all this week. Now the long heat sets in. Mosquitoes are busy but we've burned rags almost every night to keep them away. Saturday, Moss Henley and Hints went to a horse race, and Uncle Heb drove Ms. Lily and William to a neighbor lady's house for the day. So that meant I could slip into Moss Henley's study to see the map without getting caught. I found the same names I'd written down, 
the places where abolitionists live. First, there was the Philadelphia, then the New York, and the Boston. I found the Richmond and lots of other places I heard Uncle Heb and Hintz talk about. But that's all I can understand about the map. All the lines stand for something I know, but I don't know yet what they stand for. I wrote down as many names off that map as I could get on a sheet of paper, so when I write the names, they will be spelled right. All these words got to do with freedom, so I'm hoping all over myself that when they will give me a picture of freedom. Sunday. The river is high and the lowlands are flooded. Rufus talked about the great flood. Noah and his family went inside the ark and God himself locked the door. Noah and all the animals were safe inside the ark. Then the rain started falling and the waters came a-gushing up out of the ground and everything and everybody was drowned. All except in Noah, his family, and the animals. Everybody say, Amen. I really didn't understand the story. I couldn't see in my mind the world all under water. It's like this. I read the words over William's shoulder sometimes, but I don't all the time get what the words mean. Then Rufus told us his new little son was named Noah, because God saved Noah from the drowning waters. God's going to save us one day, too. But I'm talking about being saved in the Bibleistic way, he said. Amen. Monday. I just got one thing to ask. Why did God let mosquitoes get on that ark? Sunday week, second Sunday in June. All week we worked and waited for Sunday. June heat feels hotter than the same heat in May. It was hard to sit still while Rufus told the story of David. When David was about my age, he was a shepherd boy. He stood down a giant named Goliath with a slingshot and five smooth stones. We must be like David, Rufus told us. When we find ourselves facing a giant, we must not run, but face the monster with the courage of David. Everybody said amen, even me. But I didn't feel strong enough to beat up on a giant. Rufus tells good stories, but I just don't understand what makes them so great. First thing afterwards, Misty comes switching up to Hints, grinning. I don't like Missy much anymore, and I don't think it has a thing to do with Spicy. I just don't like the way she is. Monday. It's June 17th, 1859. I know because I slipped ink out of Moss Henley's study today and a newspaper that was in the trash. Sometimes I surprise myself with the things I do just so I can keep learning. Following Saturday, I am writing by the light of a full moon. There was a lot of excitement today. Moss Henley and Hintz rode in from Fredericksburg. Been gone all week. They brought back a beautiful stallion named Dancer, a gift for William. He's all yours, the master told his son. Everybody knew Moss Henley was just showing off. The horse was really a racehorse, and Hintz would be the one who would ride and care for it. But to keep Miss Lily from fussing about turning Belmont into a gambling den, Moss Henley pretended he bought the horse for William. It was so good to see Hintz. As soon as he could get away from the stables, he came to the kitchen to speak. He was full of dancer talk, went on and on about how he was going to win a hundred races riding him. Third Sunday in June. Uncle Heb left early this morning, taking the missus to visit the Ambrose Plantation. They'll be gone all day. Rufus talked on Jonah. I like that story, but I think it would be scary living in the belly of a big fish for three days and nights. We might find ourselves in the belly of a big fish at any time, but we must not be afraid. We must stay prayed up. Stay strong. Our faith will turn sour on the fish's stomach, and it will have to deliver us. Free us. Let us pray. I got on to Rufus's Bible stories today. All the weeks he'd been leading us in service, he'd been telling us two stories in one. His stories are about Bible times, but they is about our times, too. Jonah in the belly of a big fish, Daniel and the lions, and David and the giant is like us being in slavery, facing the masses. But God deliver Daniel, David, and Jonah, and he'll deliver us one day. Rufus can't say all that right out, or Moss Henley will make us stop having service but Rufus tells us that in other ways. I didn't understand the stories at first, but I do now. 
for the first time I say amen and knew why I was saying it. Monday. I went to the stables to visit Hintz for a few minutes and to take a closer look at Dancer. The horse is every bit as fine as Hintz said, not like any other. It would take a good rider like Hintz to hold him steady, though. A sure winner, Hintz say, real proud-like. And he's mine, said William, coming through the door, dressed to ride. Saddle him up. William has been riding since he could straddle a horse, but anybody can see that Dancer is too much horse for him. William, said Hintz, patient-like. Dancer is not ready for you yet. Let me work with him a little before you take him out. The boy whined and fretted, but at last he went on and rode Diamond. Still, there was something in the boy's voice that let us know he was bent, bound, and sure to ride Dancer. Last week in June, there won't be any more lessons until after the 4th of July holidays. I hate holidays. Every day there is something for us to do. We're either cleaning the house, fixing the meals, serving the meals, cleaning up after the meals. No sooner than we're finished, it's time to start all over again. When guests come, it's double work. We have to tote hot water for the guest baths, empty the water after the baths, and don't forget cleaning chamber pots and making beds at first light in the morning. That's why I hate holidays. Friday, July 1st. Today, Spicy and I were scrubbing floors, getting ready for the fourth, but moving like inchwards, creeping along. All of a sudden, Hintz hopped up on the windowsill from the porch side. Almost scared us to death. Okay, girls, why are you moving so slow? Get busy. When did we get a new master, Spicy said, being sassy. I'd be a poor master to own the two of you, he said with that devilish look in his eyes. Cloty, you ain't big as a chickadee, so I wouldn't sell you. He turned to Spicy. And you there, girl, with the dark eyes, I wouldn't sell you either. Then he added, I just keep you for myself. I could feel Spicy being happy, even though she held her head down. You like my brother friend, don't you? I asked Spicy when Hintz was gone. He's not so bad, she say, and went back to scrubbing the floors. This time she was a moving along faster and humming. July 2nd. Hintz brought Spicy a handful of flowers this morning. He shoved them at her from the kitchen door. He ain't never done nothing like that for her. For you, he said. Before Spicy could answer, he ducked away and was gone. He missed seeing the big grin that lit up her whole face. Aunt Tija shook her head and poured some water in a cup and handed it to Spicy for the flowers. We've both been teasing her all day about being courted. July 4th. Sunday rest was canceled for everybody. Too much work to do to get ready for the 4th. I'm so tired. We got our regular work to do and some more. I don't know what day it was. I was up all night yesterday, working in the kitchen with Aunt T. Aggie and Wilk come to help. Missy sees after the baby and helped out, too, when he was asleep. I did all the fetching, running from the spring house to the smoke house to the big house to the house garden to the barn and back. Get me this and get me that. I am writing this late at night, ready to crawl into a hole and sleep. But I can't. Now it's time to start cleaning up. July 6th. Things are finally getting back to normal. It will take me days to write about all that happened on the 4th. Guests started coming to Belmont early Monday morning, camping out on the grounds. Ms. Lily's daughter, Clarissa, and her family were the first to arrive. Clarissa's husband is Mr. Richard Davies, a lawyer with a fine firm in the city. He's full of seriousness, and she's a ball of nerves. I like her, though. Maybe it's because she's like a scared rabbit, about ready to run for cover. Not at all like her mama. I can't say much for Miss Clarissa's two sons, Richard Jr. and Wilbur, who are close to the same age as William. Keep something going all the time. When William gets with them, they spell T-R-O-U-B-L-E. Trouble. Soon as Richard and Wilbur set first foot out of the carriage, William came tearing out of the house like it was on fire. Then all three of them begin running through the house, screaming and yelling, out the back door, leaping over the hedges, trampling in the flower beds. Their mama just looked on like it's as natural as the rising sun. Nobody specks better of them, so they act that way. 
By mid-morning on the 4th, many more guests had come. Moss Henley tried to be real gentlemanlike, greeting people, welcoming them, shaking hands. But no matter how much he tries to look the part of a real gentleman, he's still seen as a gambler who got lucky enough to marry a woman with money. Miss Lily, on the other hand, was like a fly, fluttering about in that ugly green dress. She was lightened just long enough to say a few words, then off to another guest. At times like these, it's hard to see her slapping us or yelling at us until the veins in her neck bulge out like she's been doing all morning. My face is still stinging where she slapped me for walking too slow. Walking too slow? I was so tired I was glad to be walking at all. Everybody ate like dogs, gobbling up pots of smoked ham and beans, fresh greens, smothered chicken, gravy and rice, and all kinds of pie and cakes. Nobody ever thought about how hard we'd all had to work to fix it. They just ate. On full stomachs, Moss Henley didn't have no more sense than to call everybody together to hear Cleophus Tucker, the man who Moss Henley wanted people to vote for. Mr. Tucker's talk was full of too many words, but people were nice about pretending to listen. I was half asleep until I heard the word abolitionist. Then I listened real close. I, for one, am tired of abolitionists telling me what I should do with my slaves. I'm tired of lawless meddlers coming into our communities and spiriting away our Negroes on this so-called underground railroad. It felt so good to know these words, but I still didn't get a full understanding of what they mean. July 7th, picking up from yesterday. Hints was set to ride Dancer against a horse named Windaway, brought up from Atlanta, that was supposed to be the fastest horse on four feet. Just about everybody bet on the Atlanta mount. I overheard Moss Henley whisper to Hintz, You'd better ride him to win, boy, or else. Hintz laughed in a devil-may-care way and spurred Dancer onto the field. Come on, Hintz, I shouted, knowing that if he lost, he'd have Moss Henley to reckon with. All the folks from the quarters was pulling for him to win, including Missy. Aunt T screamed so, she plumb lost her voice. But it was spicy, Spicy who outshouted us all. I wasn't the only one to notice it either. I caught Missy giving Spicy a mean, mean look. Hints didn't need our cheering, cause he won with room to spare. Moss Henley carried on so, bragging and all. Folks started finding excuses to leave. In the far away, I just heard the sound of a train. I wondered, is it is it on the Underground Railroad? I could see in my head slaves on the train headed for Philadelphia, the New York, and the Boston. The picture made me smile. One day I want to ride that train. July 10th. Clarissa and the boys have been here since the 4th. They go home today. Nobody will be unhappy to see the backs of their heads. While I served breakfast to William and his nephews, I heard William talking about riding Dancer by himself. When you ride up in front of our house in Richmond, then we'll believe he's your horse, said Richard. I hope William is not going to be silly enough to ride Dancer that far by himself. Should I tell Miss Lily, so maybe she'll speak to him about it? Second Monday in July. All of the guests are gone home now. We spent the morning straightening up in the guest rooms. It's sick hot, but no matter, I have to weed the house garden. The hat Hintz gave me really helps. I hardly ever take it off. Something was eating up my tomato vines. Uncle Heb say put tobacco juice on the leaves. I'd seen him use it before on his roses. So I bit off a piece of tobacco and chewed it to make the juice. Lord, I swallowed some. My head started swimming, and my stomach heaved up everything I'd eaten for breakfast two days ago. I've never been so sick in my whole life. Thought for a minute I was dying. How can anybody chew tobacco? I won't ever again. The worms can have the tomatoes. Tuesday. I saw William down at the stables. He was talking to some of the hands. I thought maybe I should tell Miss Lily what I overheard. I think he may try to ride Dancer over to Richmond, I told her. Don't be foolish, Clody. William wouldn't try to do a dangerous thing like that. She made me brush her hair before she sent me away. Maybe she's right. But somehow, I don't think so early Thursday morning. We polished silver all day. Miss Lily went over every tray, pitcher, bowl, and candlestick. 
She found one little spot on a silver tray that I had cleaned, and she slapped me so hard I saw stars. I don't get hit often, but when I do, I try to be like Spicy and not let her see me cry. Spicy is being a bad influence on you, she said, and slapped Spicy too. Miss Lily is awful, because she know we can't hit her back. If one of us whacked her back across her face, I bet she wouldn't be so quick to hit. I got to be careful not to put ideas like hitting the missus in my head. Aunt T say if you think about hitting back, you'll soon strike out, hit back, and to fight a missus or a master means death for sure. Next evening. During supper, Spicy and I served hot bread and poured water for the Henleys. We came in on Moss Henley and Miss Lily fussing about William getting something called a tutor. When Moss Henley said no, Miss Lily would not let it be. As the word fight tween them heated up, Spicy took off the soup bowls, and I served the fried chicken. Miss Lily won that battle. Later, the three of us, Spicy, Aunt T, and me, had our supper together. Whenever Aunt T fries chicken for the Henleys, she fries the chicken neck, gizzard, liver, and the last part that goes over the fence, and makes a thick brown gravy for us. Eat that with some biscuits and honey. Good eating. Spicy and me had Auntie bent over laughing, poking fun at Miss Lily's faked fainting spells. Spicy did a perfect Miss Lily swooning. Oh, he'll be the first Monroe not to get into Overton school. I played the massa. My mind is made up. William will not have a tutor. Then I belched and raised up a hip and pretended to pass gas. You girls is a mess, Aunt T say, hanging up the dish towel and blowing out the kitchen candles. I stretched out on my straw-filled pallet next to Spicy. Anybody know what a tutor is? I had been waiting for the right moment to ask. Nobody knew. I'll add it to my list of words. I figured it had something to do with William's schooling. Wonder will it mean I can't get no more learning? Day later. Spicy and I spent the evening working in the house garden with Uncle Heb. We helped him tie strips of old rags on a measure of line to shoo the critters away. He told us stories about a spider-man that could talk. Uncle Heb say his mama told him these old spider stories. He say his mama come from Afric. Say white men fell upon them one day and threw nets over her and some other girls. Then they put them on a boat and brought them across the big water. Say that's how our all our people got here. We here come from Afric on white men's boats. I once heard Aunt T talk about Afric women named Belle who taught her about root doctrine and birthing. I ain't never seen nobody that was natural born Afric. I'd like to, though. Monday, July 18th, 1859. I found out what a tutor is. It is a tutor. Miss Lily wrote it for William. He's a teacher. Heard Miss Lily telling William during his lessons that his name is Eli Harms, and he's coming here in August. He's coming from a place called Washington, D.C. I know from lessons that's where the president of the land lives in a big white house. Reckon, does this Mr. Harms know the president? Miss Lily say the tutor will stay here on the place, and his only job will be to teach William. I hope I'll get to fan them during their lessons so I can go on learning. Wednesday. The missus has had Spicy and me busy for the past few days cleaning her own personal room. We stayed busy for hours, scrubbing the floors, beating rugs, airing mattresses, and restuffing pillows. At the end of the day, missus called me to her side. You know that your mama and I were the best of friends, she said. You're smart, just like her. Why'd you let her go? I don't know what come over me. Auntie is right. If you think on a thing, you'll end up doing it. How many times had I thought about asking her that question? Now I dared to ask it. The words just popped right out of my mouth. It's a wonder she didn't slap me. Instead, she just gave me a warning. Must not be sassy, Clody. Then she studied my face. I was sure my eyes had turned into windows, and she could see all the letters and words tumbling around in my brain. So I closed my eyes, too scared to move. Yes, you're different from the others. I never know quite what's going on inside that little head of yours, but it makes me wonder. Miss Lily is scary like a bad dream. 
later. Come to find out, Miss Lily promised to give Spicy the same white handkerchief with the purple and yellow pansies on each corner if she brought her things about me. I'm not a tattler, she said. Besides, that's the ugliest handkerchief I ever seen. So, Miss Lily is looking for something on me now. I trust Spicy not to tell. But who else has she tempted? I gotta be careful. I just wrote D-A-N-G-E-R. I see Miss Lily's face. Thursday. At least I'm learning from Miss Lily. I learned today that there's no such word as node. It's new. I never knew that. I do now. Fourth Saturday in July. Something awful done happened. I knew it. Knew it. William has left here riding Dancer over to Richmond, showing off. It started when Hintz and Maz Henley were gone away to a race. William went to Uncle Heb, saying his daddy had said he could ride Dancer. I told Miss Lily he'd do it, but she didn't believe me. So Uncle Heb saddled up Dancer. Last we seen of the boy, he shot out of the stables and down the drive. I got a real bad feeling ain't nothing good coming out of this for nobody. Early the next morning, Miss Lily sent Rufus and the other riders out to follow William, but couldn't no horse in the country catch Dancer. All we could do was wait. Not long, the horse came trotting back up the drive, dragging William's body like a sack of rags. It was clear the boy had fallen off, but his foot had gotten caught. Everything that happened next is a blur. Somebody went to fetch Dr. Lamb, but it took over two hours for him to get to Belmont. Meanwhile, Aunt T did everything she could to help. Spice and I stood in the shadows of William's room, ready to fetch and hold whatever the doctor needed. I heard Miss Lily ask, Will he live? I prayed that William would live. I hope God will forgive my selfish reason. I prayed William would live, because I knew Maz Henley would make our lives miserable if his son died. Oh, yes, the doctor said, patting Miss Lily on her arm. He'll live. William's a tough little character. I felt better. Miss Lily's shoulders relaxed, too. She looked at me, and for a second I looked straight into her eyes. I dropped my eyes quickly, because we ain't supposed to look Master and Mrs. in the eye. But for that quick second I seen something. I seen that she knew that I knew that I had warned her about this, and she had not listened. She was thinking about it, too. But, added Dr. Lamb, we all listened to what was coming next. Sadness cluttered the doctor's face. I'm not so sure William will ever walk again. Miss Lily really did faint. All I can think about is that it's going to be awful when Maz Henley gets home. Day later, Monday, July 25th, 1859. When Maz Henley heard about William, he went straightway to the barn and shot Dancer, a single bullet in the horse's head, like that was going to make William well again. We could hear him crying over that horse most of the night. Then Master come looking for Uncle Heb, got in his head that Uncle Helm was to blame for what happened to William, so he came to kill him, just like the horse. Me and Spicy done learned that in times like these it is best to stay out of the way. We watched everything from the room of the kitchen, holding one another, trembling, trying not to cry out. Poor Uncle Heb tried to say what happened, but Maz Henley went to beating him with the barrel of a gun, beating him all in the head. I heard the hit licks. Hard licks over Aunt T's screaming. Uncle Hub fell down, and Moss Henley kicked him and pointed the gun at the old man's head. Don't kill him, please, Aunt T begged for her husband's life. For some reason, he didn't pull the trigger. He might as well have, though, because Uncle Hub died in Aunt T's arms an hour or so later. His big heart just stopped. Later, Moss Henley comes to the kitchen to see Aunt T when they told him about Uncle Hub dying and all. He comes saying... I lost my temper a bit. I wasn't really going to kill the old man. You've got to believe that. When Aunt T didn't say nothing, he raised his voice in an angry way. My boy is up there, unable to walk, because that old man let him ride Dancer. He's to blame. He should have known better. Blame? Ma's Henley don't care nothing about the real truth. He just make the truth what he wants it to be. The truth is, Moss was the one who brung Dancer to Belmont and gave him to William. Masters can do that. But Moss Henley will never make me believe what I know ain't so. Now you listen to me, he say, pointing his finger in Aunt T's face. I don't want you holding what happened to Uncle Hub against me. You hear? That old man just died. I didn't kill him. 
Aunt T looked at her master long and hard, like she was looking at him for the first time. You ain't got to worry. I won't poison you. I ain't that low down in ornery. Rufus tells us to hate the sin and not the sinner. I hate slavery so bad, it's mighty hard sometimes not to hate the slave masters. Men like Moss Henley. <laughs>